Hey, good to see you all. John chapter 18 today, John chapter 18. Uh, one of the things you'll notice new on campus is uh, on Friday, we welcomed in our new group of 11 interns for the year. So if you see them walking around, they are the best and you can get to know them. And uh, they are, yeah, they're, they're going to be a huge part of what we're going to do this next year. So you can get excited for that. They're all very nice people, except that one. You'll know who it is when you find them. You're like, this person is the worst. John 18. Just kidding. They're all great. John 18. We're kind of in this prosaic moment here in John's gospel. We're moving closer to the cross. And while the, this part of scripture is meant for us to understand what Jesus went through, we can pull out ideas. And anytime we look at Jesus, we can ask in terms of Christus exemplar, what does it mean to follow Christ's example? Where do we see Jesus interacting with people that we want to emulate? So as we walk closer to the cross, we're also going to pull out an idea here that we can focus on here today in our homes, in our families. John chapter 18, beginning at verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the place, to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat Passover. So Pilate, okay, so we're introduced to a character named Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, one of the things we talked about in the early service that I think is important to bring up here also is as you read through stories, there can be a sense in which we start this um, internal notion that this story began with once upon a time and ends with they lived happily ever after. The problem that I think a lot of people experience when they interact with the text is they think that this was written as some sort of uh, cautionary tale or mother goose rhyme for us to not make the same mistakes that the fools did and to be heroes like the heroes were. And yet we dig up time and time again, Nelson Glick, the father of modern archaeology, subsists. Uh, the Smithsonian Institute consistently uses the Bible to tell us where to dig, how to dig. And we find after more than 30,000 archaeological digs, not a single one has controverted a single word in scripture. And this is very much like that. A few weeks ago, we talked about how uh, in the 19th century they found the bone box of Caiaphas, who is mentioned here in the text, Caiaphas the high priest. Uh, his ossuary is, we found his ossuary. Secondly, we'll talk about this guy Pontius Pilate today, but to give it context, this is the title of the sermon. Uh, this is called uh, Caesarea Maritima. This is over in Israel. I've gotten a chance to go here a couple of times. This is a, an ancient city that was potentially ruled by Tiberius. Tiberius was one of the, uh, uh, he's a governor of Rome, but he was uh, an angry person. Okay, so he did a lot of really bad stuff. And so you kind of had these prefects and these generals. You had, obviously you had Caesar who was governor of everything. And then you had like the Herods that were kind of in charge of the vassal states. And then you had underneath those, these prefects like Pontius Pilate, who were really brought in to keep people responsible, particularly during feast times. So Pilate didn't live in Jerusalem. The prefects were brought in during festival seasons because the numbers swelled so greatly that uh, they didn't know how to, how would you subdue 1.5 million people if all these Jews came for the Passover festival? So they would bring the Roman prefects back into the city during that time. Uh, potentially, this is where Pontius Pilate probably spent a lot of his time, was in this um, little sea coast village here called Caesarea Philippi. Um, there's, a, there's a temple over here that was built to a man named Tiberius, but Pontius Pilate built it for him. So Pontius Pilate, in his symbol of homage, built the temple to uh, Tiberius. How do we know all this stuff? Great question. Because even though Pontius Pilate was historically a contentious figure, archaeologically speaking, we found this inscription. We, they found this inscription in Caesarea Mar Maritima. To the divine Augusti Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has dedicated this. So this is what this says right here. You might understand, it might be Greek to you, but it's actually, uh, so Pontius Pilate's a historical figure. So as we're reading this, Luke 13 tells us, Josephus tells us, uh, these historians, these uh, Roman historians, Greek historians, Jewish historians throughout time, contemporaneous to these events, tell the story of this man named Pontius Pilate, who was vindictive, he was angry, he was a, he was a massacrist. There's one uh, story from uh, contemporary literature of historians of the day where he came in and saw a bunch of people in the outer courts of the temple and just massacred all of them. He was a very insecure man. He tended to exercise great power over the weak and lowly, but he tended to be timid and um, 
kind of respectful to the powerful and mighty. So the question is, then how do you interact with Jesus, who is simultaneously this uh, calloused hand carpenter peasant, <laughs> and yet he kind of freaks you out, right? Like Pilate's heard these stories. He just, Pilate just sent a Roman detachment of 600 soldiers to go capture him. Why would you do that if all he was was this carpentry peasant? There was some level of respect there. Pontius Pilate didn't listen to his wife. His wife said, let that man go. He freaks me out. She's had a dream about him. She's like, I don't know what his deal is, but he's not right. He, there's something powerful about him. Just let's not have anything to do with him. So throughout Pilate's interaction with Jesus, I think you find a conflicted man. On one hand, everything that he knows, the world that he lives in, the physical realm of materialism and power and governors and authorities and, and Rome and the gods of such and the pleasures and everything of that culture rule in his heart. But then this dude kind of freaks him out. And those around him, they've heard the stories of him feeding 5,000 people and raising a dead man in John chapter 11. And the, there's a sick man at the pool of Bethesda and there's the pool of Siloam. He stands up and he's walking. There's people walking around who used to be lame. There's people who are speaking who used to be mute and seeing who used to be blind and hearing that used to be deaf. You've heard the stories. So now what do you do when you've got Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect, who's guilty of all these crimes against humanity, potentially speaking, and he interacts with Jesus, who is ultimate God in human form. It's kind of a showdown for the ages. So here's what takes place. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. Okay, so John's gospel loves the use of imagery, Ironic misunderstanding, pathetic irony, which means John's, the text tends to tell us what we're going to experience. So if it's dark, there'll be confusion. Confusion. If it's light, there'll be understanding. If we're in Jerusalem, where we would expect historically to find religious elite, well-understood minds, you're going to find people who are obstinate to the gospel. But then where you would expect to find the pagan culture, they tend to accept Jesus. So the further you get from the central religious hub, the more understanding there is. And the closer you get to the center, the more confused people are. So when you have an instance where you find yourselves in Jerusalem, the religious hub, at night, you would expect to find a lot of misunderstanding, confusion, and obstinance. That's what we're going to find. The last time we were in the walls of Jerusalem at night was in John chapter 3 in an episode we call Nick at Night. Yes, we've done it. Nicodemus, under the cloak of darkness, goes and asks Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says, you must be born again. And the confused at night, Nicodemus says, how could I fit in a birth canal at my age? And Jesus says, you fool. No, he doesn't say you fool. How do you not understand this? Jesus asks him. So here we're going to find the same thing. But we find a Gentile. We find Pilate, a non-Jew, interacting with him. This is the irony of ironies in verse 28. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Okay. So they're really worried about defiling themselves. So as they hold a crooked court illegally in the Talmud against the tenants of the Mishnah, they've done everything illegal already. They've started a trial at night. They have not brought forth witnesses. They have illegally accused Jesus. They've, under the, the guise of, of um, insurrection, convinced Pilate to bring out a detachment of soldiers. They've held him captive. They've bound him against his will, and they've brought him to the palace. They've done all of these things against the law, and they're plotting to falsely accuse the God of the universe and to execute him, but they're worried about defilement by crossing the threshold of a Gentile door. This is perfectly what Jesus says when he talks to the Pharisees and he says, you are bedazzled caskets. You bejewel your caskets. Oh, look how fancy it is. It made a rose. But inside your bones, you're dead. You look great on the outside and you're dead on the inside. Oh, we couldn't cross a threshold of a Gentile doorway. We need the Roman prefects to come out and meet us because we could not possibly engage in something that was dirty, crooked, or broken while they hold a whole fictitious trial to put the God of the universe to death. This is meant to make you laugh. The scripture puts us in here so you would go, this is the goofiest thing ever. But then to look at scripture as a mirror and go, where do I find myself doing the same thing? 
Well, I can think all these bad thoughts and have this hate in my heart, but I don't want anyone to know it. That would be a problem, right? So, uh, there's a, in the Oholeth and the, the contemporary sources of that time that were talking about Jewish custom and literature, um, the belief is that a lot of Gentiles, for different kind of sacrifices and for the sake of convenience, abortion was very popular un, uh, amongst these Gentile people that Jesus was speaking to and interacting with. So the belief was that in many of these homes, there were aborted babies underneath the floorboards and in the sewage systems, as people would create and, and get rid of this life again and again. And so the Jews were just told not to enter into the homes because they couldn't come into contact with a dead body. So the punishment for crossing a Roman threshold or a Gentile threshold was that you had to take a ceremonial bath. But they were concerned they weren't going to be able to eat the Passover, which would have taken longer to cleanse yourself from touching a dead body than it would have from just crossing a threshold. So historians believe they're actually worried more so about potentially touching dead bodies than they are about just crossing the threshold. So there's something deeper going on here. This, this just, it just kind of puts this idea, right? Like, well, we couldn't do that because we might touch a dead body and yet they're going to go put the, the bread of life to death. It's, it's just, it's a little bit backwards. And the gospel wants you to raise an eyebrow and go, this is silly what they're doing. And this is what happens when you don't have Christ in you. There's a silliness to everything. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? And you'll notice their response is a little bit um, repugnant. If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And you're kind of like, hey, excuse me, Jewish authorities, that's kind of a rude way to talk to your prefect. But what's Pilate doing? When you ask questions in this case, you're starting the trial. But where did they get the detachment of soldiers to go bring Jesus to here? Pontius Pilate already gave them a detachment of soldiers. Now they're using the detachment to bring him forward, and Pontius Pilate has the audacity to ask, what charges are you bringing against this man? So they're almost, right, that's like little aside in television shows where they're like, hey, what do you mean? What are we bringing against him? We've already been over this. He's an insurrectionist. He's broken our law. He claims to be God. But Pilate now is flipping the script and he wants to make this a legitimate trial. So he starts as you would in any trial. What are the official charges against this man? And they go, charges? We don't need charges, right? We don't, we, 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 we already went over this. But he's consistent. He's insistent. Pilate said, Then take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone they objected. So in about 26 AD, in the law, the, the Romans took away the power of execution away from the Jews because apparently they loved doing it. So Rome says, From here on out, if you want to execute someone legally, we have to give you permission to do so. And the Jews had a system of killing people that we find in Acts chapter 7 with a man named Stephen or in John chapter 8 when they wanted to stone a woman caught in adultery, which was to throw rocks at people until they died. That was their favorite way of doing it. Which is interesting because did they have permission to stone the adulterous woman in John 8? Nay. Did they have permission to stone Stephen in Acts chapter 7? No. So why go through the trouble of doing it here? Because Jesus was powerful. They needed Rome to be on their side. And they all of a sudden are going, we can't do this one by ourselves because if we kill this guy through stoning, we're all going to be killed. We can't. They need Rome's help. And this is what the, what the text says right here. Um, this, this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Again and again in the text, Jesus has made it clear about how he is to die. This is 1,500 years in the making, back from Psalm chapter 22, when David writes a prophecy about Messiah. What's going to happen to him? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are your hands so far from me? Psalm 22. They pierce my hands and my feet. My bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax within me. They've pierced my side. I'm surrounded by a band of robbers. They cast lots from my garments. My, uh, my, the, my mouth is dried up like a potsherd. There's a prophecy 1,500 years in the making about how Jesus is going to die. And so Rome has to do it because only Rome pierces. Only Rome lifts up. This is what Jesus says. John chapter 3, Nicodemus. As the snake in the desert was lifted up on a pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. In the Greek, hypsao. John loves this wordplay here that in Jesus' glory, in his being lifted up, 
Okay, that word hipsao has dual meaning. It can mean like hoist someone on your shoulders in glory, right? Rudy at the end of Rudy. Or, um, you know, the, the coach at the end of Miracle on Ice in the 1980s. Yay, good job. Hipsa we hipsaoed him and he's in glory. But hipsao can also mean to raise up. So Jesus is saying, my raising up on a cross will also be my raising up in glory. It will mean both things. So Jesus can't be stoned to death. So to fulfill the scriptures, which is so funny, because the Pharisees, if there's one thing they want to avoid, it's that this man looks like Messiah, and yet they have to go through a system that pierces hands and feet and make him look like a Messiah in order to accomplish what they want to accomplish. It's as if God is sovereign over the whole thing. It's like he had it figured out ahead of time. Continuing. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him. I just, I have to read this through the lens of a deeply curious, very powerful man. It reminds me of Mark chapter 10 when Jesus interacts with the rich young ruler. Where you're like, what business have you, rich young ruler, with this peasant Jesus? There was just, Isaiah 53 tells us, there was nothing about Jesus' appearance that would have drawn you to him. And yet people were drawn to him. As a man who, from people would hide their faces, so the Son of Man was considered stricken, smitten, and afflicted before, the, before God Almighty, Isaiah 53 tells us. So why are people so intrigued by this guy? They've heard his stories. He did not do them under the cloak of darkness. He preached in the temple, the kingdom of God. He called himself the temple that was going to be torn down and rebuilt in three days. But then he kept backing it up. Why are miracles in the Old and New Testament to confirm a new message? So the idea is that if someone is performing miracles, they're either doing so as a false prophet or as a real one. But either way, Pontius Pilate knows he's in the presence of power. He's just not sure what kind. So he asks him, Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Pilate replied, I don't care. Am I a Jew? I don't care. But he does. Because if he didn't care, why not just go, hey, I'm not, it's early in the morning. I don't want to have this trial. Get out of here. So there's a sense in which, in order to appease the, the sycophantic governors, he's got to keep peace. But he doesn't want to kill the guy because the guy freaks him out. So what do you do? When you can't kill him because you're afraid of insurrection against you and your job is to keep the peace during Passover, the Hagia Festival, I want to keep peace. I don't want anyone coming over here and saying I'm a bad prefect. But then I'm also the ruler of the Jews and they really want to kill this dude. What do you do? You wash your hands and you say, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let you do what you want. I'm going to create every situation possible to put this on the Jews and not on myself on the Jewish leaders and not myself. Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Look, he's like, you, your own people have got beef with you. Don't put this on Rome. We didn't do anything. It's your people. So he's almost asking him, he's like, listen, I don't care because y'all are Jews. You believe in weird junk. I don't care. But bro, what did you do? Your friends want to kill you. That's nuts. And I've heard some weird stuff, but so what have you even done? Jesus' response, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. So Jesus calms Pontius Pilate's question here by going, I'm not a threat to you. If, look, and there's a, there's a bit of pretense here in a good way because Jesus is, he's even taken this opportunity to witness to Pontius Pilate. He doesn't say, I'm not a king. He doesn't say, I'm not powerful. He doesn't say, I don't know. He doesn't say, I'm confused. He just tells him, I'm not here to overthrow your kingship. But then he seems to insinuate, because if I was, it wouldn't be difficult. But my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, and they would fight better than Peter, who cut off Malchus's ear, aiming for Judas's throat. Okay, so he's like, just so we're clear, Peter is not representative of my people, okay? I command angel armies that fight against the powers and principalities of the world. That's not indicative. I don't have 12 servants. I have legions of angels, if I wanted to. But now my kingdom is from another place. Okay, so, so you're a king. 
You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. And he's, there almost seems to be this sense in which Jesus is, is anthropomorphized. He's condescending to Pilate. I don't mean that to be condescending. He's, uh, that word means he's stooping down and speaking his language. How does he make sense of a heaven reality to an earthly king? Oh, so you're a king. And Jesus goes, yes, but I'm not just a king. The best way you're going to understand me is to think of me as a king, but I'm not just a king. When, when Thomas finds out that Jesus has been resurrected, he falls at his face and he says, my, my Lord and my God, my King and my Savior. There's a very real sense in which Jesus is Pilate's king. But he's also saying, but I'm more than a king. See, a king has a rule. A king has a reign. A king has a kingdom. Basileia in the Greek, where we get the term basilica. I have a kingdom rule. I have a kingdom reign. You're right. But I'm not just a king. If you think of me as just a king, you're going to miss why I'm here. Because I'm both king and savior. And now, there are people in the world, even in our modern culture, who love that Jesus is king. He's the one who gives commands. We follow him. But we don't give our life over to him as savior of our lives. We don't let him deal with our sin problem. We don't surrender our brokenness to him and receive in him new life. We just go, the ways of God are pretty important. I'm going to do what the king says. We call that moralistic, therapeutic deism. MTD. Because this is a God, I'm going to be a nice person. But then there's people who trust in him as savior, or they believe that he is able of, to save, but they actually don't see him as king. These are the people who, this is very San Diego culture. Like Pontius Pilate is actually native to San Diego. Did you guys know that? It's in the Greek. He's from San Diego. Because San Diego culture is kind of, you believe in rocks? Sweet. I believe in God. What about you? Buddha? Love it. What about you? Tricycles? Let's all worship together. It's, right, anyone who actually knows about any of those is going, uh, no. Right? Like, lovingly, if your car says coexist, it really just says, I haven't read enough. Because, What? If, now, if you mean we can all coexist and not go to war with each other, for sure. Jesus is underneath a polytheistic society, and he doesn't attack anyone. Coexist in that. But you can't coexist in philosophy and ideology and belief, right? I'll give you three belief systems. Every, even the Abrahamic belief systems. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And in those three, you ask one simple question. What happened to Jesus on the cross? He saved our sins. It wasn't really him. It was a fake person who was made to look like Jesus. And Jesus is of no consequence. Who cares if a peasant king died? Who cares? You, those three things are, don't, they don't, they can't coexist. They are at odds with one another by their nature. So Pontius Pilate kind of assumes this responsibility where he goes, no, I'm cool with you doing. And he asks, am I a Jew? Right? This is no, of no consequence to me. You and I are like ships passing in the night. You're the king of the Jews. Great, I'm not a Jew, so it doesn't apply to me. This is, this is like um, witnessing and uh, proselytizing in San Diego is like this. You believe in Jesus? Dude, sick. Do you? No, man. Sick. Yeah, but the scripture says... If you do not know Christ, you will spend forever separated from him. No way. Sick. It's like, that, no, you, it's, you're being implicated. The, if this book, if it's sick that I believe this, the belief is that you're going to meet God face to face someday and you're going to have to give an account for your life. Not just those who believe. There won't be like a religious group that meets God and an irreligious group that doesn't. It, it, we all are going to meet God. Pilate's kind of comfortable in this in-between. As long as you're not calling you my king, as long as you're not saying you're my king, then you're not my problem. Continuing. You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world, so he, he corrects him. I'm a king. You're right. No argument. But I've always been a king. I was a king before the word king was invented. I was a king before Greek was spoken. I was a king before you were born. 
I was a king before kings had kingdoms. I was a king before lords had lords. I was a king before this world existed. I was a king before time was anything. I was a king before light without reference was created. I've always been a king. So if this is new to you, it's old to me. I'm not here because I'm a king. I've always been a king. Now, do you want to know why I'm here? That's different. I'm not here to convince you that I'm a king. I'm a king whether you think I am or not. If you got up right now with a sharpie and wrote the word dark on the wall, it wouldn't turn the lights off. You'd just be wrong. In the same way, whether you believe that God is, Jesus is king is of no consequence to him. It doesn't make him less of a king. If you think he's a great moral teacher, it doesn't change the fact that he's a king. If you think that he is uh, a cosmic consultant, it doesn't change that he's a king, right? If you've got a president and you go, not my president, that they, they are though. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. I get the sentiment. But you wouldn't understand that that's like still the case. You know what I mean? It's the way the world works. So it's fun to say that. I get it. I understand it. It's like anarchy. But like at the same time, you know that that's true, right? Like, anyway, every football season, everyone's like, that's not my MVP. It's like, yeah, but it is because you don't get to, okay, great. He is your king. You don't have to acknowledge it, but he's your king. So Jesus is simply saying, I, <laughs> I'm king, but if this is your, if you thought that's why I'm on trial, it's because I just became king. I've been king when you were a toddler and you had your little binky pacifier. That was like, I've always been a king. Now, ask me why I'm here. I'm here to testify to the truth. Why, John 1, did the word become flesh? I didn't become flesh so I could convince you that I was king. I became flesh to take on the penalty of your sins, to testify to the truth. That's why I'm here. I'm here because you live a lie and I am the truth. I have come to testify to the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What a powerful moment for Pilate to sit down and push a cup of coffee over to Jesus and go, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Walk me through truth. Help me understand truth. We Greeks believe in, we Romans believe in all different kinds of truth. And you're preaching a different kind of truth. But you can do some crazy stuff to walk me through it. And instead, Pontius Pilate simply says, potentially cynically, oh, what is truth? And then it says in the text, at this, that means at this moment or at this response, in response to something, at this, at what? What did Jesus say in response, when, when he asked him, what is truth? What did Jesus say? Nothing. He doesn't say anything. But does that mean he didn't answer his question? John chapter 1 verse 14 Christ has come into the world and he is full of grace and truth. John 4, 24, the Samaritan woman says, where are we going to worship? And he says, it's not about where you worship, it's about how you worship. For true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And in case anyone missed the point, John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So when Pontius Pilate says, what is truth? What does Jesus say? Just because he doesn't say anything doesn't mean he didn't answer his question. What is truth? I wonder if Jesus just stares at him in the eye. In that, could you imagine the way that Jesus could have stared into your soul? Colossians chapter 1. Through him all things were made. That's you, that's me, that's everyone. Is there something that's just deeply penetrating about Jesus' gaze when he looks at Pontius Pilate where he goes, I am out of here. Maybe he said exactly what he wanted to say. You're asking the wrong question, friend. It's not what is truth. It's who is truth. Truth has gone from a concept into reality in flesh, in a person. The, the immutable, unchanging, never-ending, consistent truth of the universe is not taxes and death. It's a person named Jesus Christ. He is the truth, the non-changing truth. So he answers his question without saying anything. What is truth? And Jesus just stares at him. And his question his answer freaks Pontius Pilate out enough to go and proclaim boldly what? He says this, I find no basis for a charge against him. <laughs> Yikes. Whatever it was in that moment, which is bold because he just claimed to be a king. He just claimed to have a kingdom. He just said he could overthrow if he felt like it. And yet Pilate goes, I'm not going to touch this guy. 
but it is your custom for me to release for you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. The book of Matthew tells us that Barabbas has a full name. Do you know what, you know what Barabbas' full name was? Jesus Barabbas. Isn't that funny? Which is why he qualifies. Do you want me to release Jesus Barabbas or Jesus King of the Jews? The word Jesus literally means Yahweh saves. He saves. So what do you want? Who's Barabbas? Barabbas is an insurrectionist. He's a murderer. Mark chapter 15 verse 7 tells us that he participated in an uprising. He, what's an uprising? He came to overthrow a kingdom. Barabbas is guilty of murder and overthrowing a kingdom. If you're an insurrectionist, the claim on you is that you came in, failed to understand what the kingdom rules were, and then you made an effort to usurp and overthrow that king. Which is ironic then, because on the day of Calvary where three crosses were put up, one was meant for the robber on Jesus' left side, one was meant for the robber on Jesus' right side, and the center one was meant for Barabbas. So Jesus takes Barabbas' cross. He's up there. Why is it thief, murderer, Jesus, blasphemer, and then thief, murderer? Because it was supposed to be thief, murderer, thief, murderer, thief, murderer, and yet Jesus took the center man's cross. Barabbas, it was Barabbas' cross. This is the perfect picture of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus on my life. It's me, and it's Jesus. I am Barabbas. I am an insurrectionist. I live in God's kingdom, but I, I, make it, I, I have an effortful plea every day to have my own kingdom. I want to overthrow the powers that be. I don't want to abide in your kingdom. What did Adam and Eve do? Insurrection. I don't want to be underneath your rule. I want to be my own king. I want to have my own rules. I'm the insurrectionist. And then there's Jesus over there. And the father who is the great judge says, I'll release one and the other one must pay. Well, if he was looking at it through a lens of simply justice, he would just look at it and go, you're the guilty man, get on the cross. But our father speaks a language both of grace and truth and justice. And he says, if, you're, if you, the innocent man, will pay the price of the guilty man, then the guilty man can walk free. So how am I saved? I am saved I, Barabbas, am saved because Jesus, the perfect one, was crucified on the cross that was meant for me. That's how, Jesus can main, that's how the Father can maintain his love and execute his justice in perfect harmony. Someone's got to take my place. And that someone was Jesus. Give us Barabbas. The, the picture that I want us to kind of walk out of, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm just going to kind of give you this as we wrap up. There's a powerful attribute of Jesus that I think probably, if pushed, um, I recognize his grace and love, and those things are so important. I think something that speaks to me as a man, something that speaks to my spirit individualistically, might be my favorite characteristic about Jesus, because it is in some ways so relatable, but in most ways so unrelatable to me, is the idea of, uh, of Jesus' meekness. Okay, meekness is a really interesting word. It's a, it's a word that we don't use a lot in our culture because meekness has become synonymous with weakness, right? If you think of someone as meek, you probably think of them as kind of like timid and gentle and sycophantic and a yes man. Meek, meek people are yes men. The scripture actually paints this very different picture of Jesus. And, and even in the, the Beatitudes of, of Matthew chapter 5, it says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Ble that word blessed almost comes from this idea of nearer the kingdom of God, nearer the heart of the Father are those who are meek, for theirs is the kingdom of... And, and I want to dive into some of these ideas as we walk through here. The first one is this. Humility seems to be almost a, a posture of the heart. And humility, as one theologian puts it, is to have a proper view of yourself. To understand yourself rightly is humility. Now, to have a proper understanding of yourself seems to, in a lot of ways, go against our modern culture. But as C.S. Lewis said, humility doesn't make the fast man slow or the smart man dumb. Okay, If you're an Olympic sprinter and someone says, do you run fast? And you say, no, you are a liar. It's not humility. 
Humility is to recognize where that came from and what you're supposed to do with it. That's humility. Humility is to recognize without the Father, you wouldn't have life, you wouldn't have legs, you wouldn't have competence. Without the Father's grace and mercy in your life and creative abilities, you would have nothing. And at any given moment, we, we, every breath we take, we're making a bet that the Lord is going to be gracious to give you your next one you're about to take in. Grace. Grace. Your heart beating primally inside of your chest that you have no control over except for the snake midbrain and part of who you are is keeping that thing going. It's grace, it's grace, it's grace, right? It's over and over again. Humility is recognizing I might be the fastest person on my team, but without Christ, I am nothing. I'm dead. I'm pointless. And when I run, I run because God has given me this ability and I owe it back to him in his glory. That's humility. You don't need to be slow, right? But you run for a bigger purpose. This is what humility is. It's the proper view of oneself. This is what it says in uh, Philippians chapter two. We should all have the same attitude, okay? P perspective as that of Christ Jesus. Beginning at verse five, Philippians two. Who being in very nature God did not think that clinging to all of the attributes of, or, or, or all of the high places of God is something he had to grab at every moment, but instead he let that go. And he took the form of a, form of a servant, being found in human likeness, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and tongue confess above, under, and on the earth that he is Lord of the glory of God the Father. This is proper humility. He knew who he was. Never once when asked, when someone said, are you, the, are you God? Did he ever go, no, not me. <laughs> God is such a complicated word. No, he said, yes. He sometimes said, don't tell anyone, <laughs> right? But he had a proper view of himself. This is what N.T. Wright says. I think it's powerful. Humility means accepting reality with no attempts to outsmart it. Humility is accepting the reality of who you are with no attempts to outsmart it, right? Well, God's given me everything that I have, but, you know, I've had to work hard too. Let it go. Just as the great theologian Elsa once said, just let it go. Because that's, that's our American caveat. Well, I mean, God gave me life, but I work hard. Why do you think that hard work is virtuous? Where did you get your hands from? Where did your decision-making faculties come from? Why do you have any ability whatsoever? Why do you? Everything's borrowed. If you use it for his glory, great, but we own nothing. Don't outsmart reality. Meekness, on the other hand, or if humility is the, the attitude towards it, meekness is the execution of your talents and treasures. Meekness is in view of the proper reality that you have, how do you execute the things that you have then? What, what do you do with them? Meekness is, almost has the, uh, the idea that it's, it's behavioral. You behave in a meek way. You understand yourself in humility and then you behave and interact with people through meekness. Meekness is, again, what's one of my favorite characteristics. It's, it's why I think Spider-Man's so much more interesting than Superman in so many cases, Right? Uh, Superman, he's got his fans, but the world connects with Spider-Man on a deeper level. Partly because he's a high school kid and he's kind of dumb, right? And there's uh, my favorite part of every one of the Spider-Man movies, of which I think there's 37 of them. But you have like the Tobey Maguire one, the Andrew Garfield one, and like the Tom Holland one, and just a compendium of other ones. But my favorite are the ones where he first recognizes that he's Spider-Man. He gets bit by the spider, and then he starts like testing his powers. And then he starts to understand and control his powers. And then he goes to high school. That's, the, that's always the most interesting moment when he goes back to high school knowing full well that he just punched Green Goblin in the face and he has the power to like web shoot whatever he wants to, but he's supposed to go to math class. And Flash, his bully, comes up to him and is like pushing him against the locker. And he's like, I could murder you. Okay, right? Like he just, he has this power of knowing. It's meekness. He, doesn't, he isn't weak. If needed to in that moment, if there was a school bus full of kids hurling towards a cliff, he wouldn't go, I'm impotent to stop it. He could do it. But when it came to his own personal ridicule and everything, he just had power under control. This is not my time. This is not, I'm, I'm not, this is not my time to exercise this. I'm not here to make you look a fool. This is not my point. This isn't why God's given me these gifts. I have them, make no mistake, but this is not my time to execute them. This idea of power under control. A little chart. Oh, 
a quote. This one's good. The meek man has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his life. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. That is his motto. He knows well that the world will never see him as God sees him, and he has stopped caring. What has that led to? Rest. He rests perfectly content to allow God to place his own values and so will have attained a place of soul rest. As he walks on in meekness, walking on the hallways of his school, getting made fun of, he will be happy to let God defend him. He has found the peace which meekness brings. He has found the peace which meekness brings. John Stott, meekness is not weakness, but rather it's strength under control. It is the humble strength that belongs to the man who has learned to submit to difficulties and sorrows, disappointments and hurts, realizing that in everything God is working for his good. A little bit of a chart for those of us who are curious, because you love charts, I've heard. If you're in this first category, you go, look, I've got a, I don't have any real power, so you don't really need to worry about me. I don't have any gifts. You're wrong. You're just wrong. The scripture makes it very clear. God gives spiritual gifts. Uh, the book of Romans chapter t- uh, 12 talks about each of us has given a, been given a different gift. Um, you might have the gift of mercy and help and teaching and evangelism and whatever it might be. But then you also have leverage in your life. You've got uh, the power of influence over those who are around you. You have uh, money. You have physical advantages, some of us in different categories. And one thing that you'll recognize, I think particularly when it comes to like physical advantages, is one thing that I found true in my life is that people who are built like green, Great Danes act like Great Danes, and sometimes people who see themselves as Chihuahuas bark like Chihuahuas. Have you noticed that? When I, I was dating, uh, before I was married to Paige in 2000, and I don't know, I graduated from college in 2011, uh, I moved down to Oceanside and there were all these like baseball players at Concordia that would keep like trying to hit on my wife and I didn't like that. So I decided I was going to uh, get a black belt in martial arts. So I did. I got a couple of them. Why? Because I figured I'm just going to, so like for five days a week for like a year and a half, I would go and I would train in this dojo. It's a lot nerdier now when I talk about it than it was at the time. But I was going to get like, oh yeah, if I ever need to use this. But what you notice when you start doing that and you start sparring with people and everything is when you would interact with these people at the gym, they weren't looking to fight anyone, even though they could. It was like the more that they knew what they were capable of doing, the more they moved towards peaceable agreements. And the people who, were, <laughs> who would like square up with you like this, you know, like an old boxer, they like wanted to fight all the time. And the people in the gym would be under control like, hey, we don't need to fight right now. We don't need, which is so funny because it wouldn't end well for Jimmy Boxy over here, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't end well because there, there's a power to knowing. And the movement that God's calling us to is not, you've got to get weak. You've got to have zero dollars in your bank account. This is what it means to follow. No, it's meekness. It's just knowing what that stuff is for. It's knowing that it's not meant to make your name great, but to make his name great. Why do we have strength? Why do we have power? Why do we have influence? Why do you have abilities? Why do you have muscles? Why do you go to the gym? Because if God ever needs you to use that for his kingdom and his service to defend the weak and the powerless, you use it. Not that you don't have it. You should be ready for his service at all times. So don't be deceived and think you don't have any. And if you think you don't have any and you have no control over it, it doesn't, that doesn't even make sense. I have no powers and I can't control them. It's just like a victim mentality. Right? It, it would be difficult for God to use this person who thinks, I don't have powers, and if I did, I wouldn't be able to control them. It's kind of an ER, ER mentality. It doesn't work super well. You've got other people that we've experienced in culture that are exploitative, where they have power, but they don't know how to control it. So they use it to make themselves better, to uplift themselves, to make themselves richer. They're exploitative people. And lastly, you have people like Jesus, who have power, but it's under control. This is true biblical meekness. It's when, it's when you play basketball with your three-year-old son and he's like, Dad, I beat you. You don't go, uh-uh, you cheated. It's stupid. Foul. You don't do that. When your kid climbs on your back when you're playing basketball with his little plastic ball set, you're like, uh-uh, oh, oh, and you fall over, right? No one walks in and goes, you weak man, get up, get up. Travel, like call travel on a two-year-old. It's, it's just, it's like, no, technically speaking, technically. No, you don't do that, right? It's power under control. We all know you can beat him. But what's the purpose of this interaction right now? It's relationship. It's connection. It's camaraderie. It's bonding. So we'll end with a couple of these ideas. So if we have this power, and we're supposed to control it, is it ever supposed to be unleashed? Yes. 
if you've got finances, if you've got power, if you've got strength, if you've got ability, if you have intellect, if you have the gift of repartee, if you've got the gift of gab, if you've got influence in culture, if you've got a circle of friends and family, if you've got, you are supposed to find time to use it when? When it aligns with the, with the character of God. When it aligns with his will for your life. And here's the problem that I've run into in my life. Just because I know the right thing to do, remember this, God's will always has a what, a when, and a how. Not just a what. If you find a biblical character who found themselves rebelling against God's will, who genuinely tried to follow it at one point in their life, most of the time, they don't fail in this category. They fail in one of these two categories. And maybe you've experienced this in your own life. Maybe there's someone in your family who needs to hear hard truth, so you scream at them. You might have said what you needed to say, but you can be right and wrong at the top of your voice. Or we find situations like um, Saul in the Old Testament who wanted to give a sacrifice to God before battle and God said, I want you to wait. And he said, I'm going to do it whenever I feel like it. And his when was off. God tells Moses to bring water from a rock. And so he does it right when he tells him to and he brings water from a rock, but he, instead of doing it the way God said, he's going to beat the rock with a stick. God said, that's not how I asked you to do it. So here's a question I want to ask in conclusion. We first have to assess, Lord, what power have you given me? What's my influence? Where is my strength? And then ask myself, are these things under control? Am, am, am I exploitative to the people that are around me? At the end of my life, will I have looked at all this power and all this influence and it's only been used to make my life greater? Am I building your name or am I, am I building mine? We're going to conclude with one of my favorite songs that's been a song that every ministry I've ever been a part of for 10 years, every camp we've ever gone to, every mission trip we've ever gone on, we've ended with this song. And the last line of this song just hits me so deeply. It says, I pray it's said about my life that I did more to build your name than mine. This is, this is what meekness is about. Did I trade in the currency of my power and my finances and my influence and my strength? Did I trade it in for kingdom things that are not of this world? Or do all my powers exist to make the kingdom of my world a lot greater and better with no consequence to what his world is all about? Let's pray. Jesus, as you stood on trial in front of your accusers, it would have been so easy to demonstrate in fullness your power to level Pontius Pilate with the words I am, to turn him into some sort of strange animal with just a word of your voice or to snap your fingers and turn him into smithereens and yet you interact with him. You take insults from him. You allow him to downplay you because you understood there was a bigger purpose at hand. Lord, would you demonstrate the bigger purpose in our lives? Would you help us with calling so we're not just chasing every potentiality in our life? Make us aware of our influence and then teach us the how, the what, and the when to influence your kingdom that is not of this world. We pray these things in your name. Amen.